Hey, it's good to see you all today. Uh, we have a, a, a really good fortune today. We're gonna to get to talk with Elizabeth Colbert, a staff writer for The New Yorker and a Pulitzer Prize winning author about, as Hallie said, her new book, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. And ordinarily at this point in one of these proceedings, I would try to describe Elizabeth's book, but I think I'll save you all that and let Elizabeth summarize it for you. Elizabeth. So the book is, I, I, I actually had to work really hard to find the two sentence summary, <laughs> but the book is really about um, ways that we as humanity have intervened in what I will call for lack of a better word, the natural world. Um, sometimes this is consciously and sometimes it is unwittingly and now we are discovering we don't really care for the results of that intervention. So we're looking for new ways to intervene, add another layer of intervention on top of that to correct for the previous intervention. All right, yeah, and it's, it's a wonderful book. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, as I read it, uh, I was just curious, how did it come about? You're a staff writer for The New Yorker. Did you write a whole bunch of stories and then find out, oh, they all connect in some way? Or did you have a theme in mind and, you know, pitch stories to your editors that followed the theme or something else? Well, it, it did sort of arise from a story that I wrote um, a few years ago, maybe four years ago, um, which is actually at the center of the book. So not, you know, the book is not in the chronological order in which I reported things. And that story involved what had already become nicknamed as the Super Coral Project. And the, the idea behind the Super Coral Project was, um, you know, the oceans are warming very fast. Everyone in this audience knows that. And one group of organisms, they're also acidifying for the same reasons, CO2 emissions. Um, and one group of organisms that it's already quite clear is unhappy with these changes is reef building corals. So these tiny little gelatinous an animals that build these extraordinary structures that are coral reefs. And over the last 30 years or so, the Great Barrier Reef, for example, which is the biggest reef in the world, um, has lost about 50% of its coral cover. So that's very you know, startling and staggering figure. And so some scientists in the US and Australia had come up with this idea I, idea, I guess you'd say, well, we've, you know, we've kind of mucked around with the oceans. We're not getting that heat out of the oceans. That's not happening in a human time scale. If we want to have reef building corals, if we want to have reefs, now we're going to kind of have to manipulate corals to find more heat tolerant, somehow nudge them to be more heat tolerant. And they were experimenting with all sorts of different ways to do that. And that piece, that idea, okay, we've mucked with the oceans, now we're gonna have to manipulate you know, the reefs, that sort of struck me as kind of a new chapter in our long and very vexed relationship uh, to nature. And that sort of set me down this path. Okay, yeah. um, several sections of the book, it seemed to me like, uh, well, these proposed new engineerings of the planet or whatever seemed a little bit far-fetched almost. It's like, you know, well, yeah, we'll try this, but it, you know, re-engineer coral to build a huge area of coral reefs and whatever. One of the areas, sort of the, the book seemed to aim to culminate in a discussion of solar geoengineering and uh, which has been extremely controversial. I know on our science and security board, which you were a member of at one point, I mean, it's almost fisticuffs sometimes when they start talking about solar <laughs> geoengineering. And, uh, I, I guess I'd ask you, well, what did you come to, what was your take on the whole solar engineering situation right now? And, and are, have you come into that fight at all? Are people uh, pushing back against what you wrote in the book? You know, I haven't gotten a lot of pushback. I think that um, I, I, I hope that the, you know, the book makes, I think, lets the people who want to do the research. Um, I don't think there's anyone out there at this point saying, you know, yeah, let's 
just go do solar geoengineering, but there are definitely people pushing to do research. It's a very current topic um, because of it actually balloon, ex not even an experiment, balloon flight that is proposed for this summer in, in Sweden. Um, but I think I, you know, I hope, I like to think that I let pe people make the case. I think that my own, you know, definitely let's call it ambivalence to say the least about this technology also comes through. So I haven't gotten anyone yet saying, you know, oh, you came down too far on one side or the other, but you know, I'm, I'm sure there are those people out there saying that to themselves, maybe just not saying it to me. And for the people here who may not be aware of this solar geoengineering research project, what, what is it? What, what are they planning to do? Because it's actually fairly small, right? Yes, it's very small. It's arguably not even, it's not even really an experiment what they want to do. So I guess I'll explain solar geoengineering very briefly uh, in case there's anyone in the audience who's not familiar with this. The idea behind solar ge geoengineering is we've you know dumped all this CO2 into the atmosphere that's warming the earth. We don't really have a good way to deal with climate change on a short term time scale because CO2 hangs around for a long time and it continues to warm the planet as long as it's up there. So the idea here is well, we could counteract warming by basically mimicking volcanoes, putting some kind of reflective material in the stratosphere, the way volcanoes do, um, to, to create this sort of reflective haze that would reflect sunlight back to space and have a cooling effect. And in theory, at least, you could you know, use that to counteract all or some of the warming we're, we're causing by dumping CO2 into the atmosphere. And, this is a very, at this point, you know, theoretical idea. I think most people who study it feel that it is probably technically feasible, although we really don't, you know, there are lots and lots and lots of questions to be answered. But what these guys want to do from Harvard, from the Harvard Solar Geoengineering Research Program is just see if they can basically get a balloon with some in instruments in the, in the gondola up into the stratosphere. That's really all that this first stage would be. And then in subsequent stages, if they can do that, they would release a very small amount of material, uh, maybe sulfur dioxide, maybe calcium carbonate, and it would form a sort of plume of particles. And then these instruments would go through the plume and measure how they just take measurements of how they're behaving. That's really the first step in terms of actual impact you know virtually non-existent but many people oppose it because of the sort of camel's nose under the tent theory yeah and that's where the title of the book comes from you know un under a white sky it's like if if they do this maximally the sky might change color yes if you dumped enough stuff up there there you know once again we sort of only have you know calculations of this um, but the wavelengths of light that are hitting the planet would change and you'd get this effect, you know, that's sort of been called sky whitening. Uh, that you discussed a, ho a whole bunch of other techniques that fit under geoengineering, but, you know, they're all actually kind of different. But one of the main ones is like actually removing carbon dioxide from the air. And you went through several of these schemes. I mean, what did you think of them? I mean, they, they all seemed very, very early stages. Like it's hard to imagine them ever scaling up enough to work. What did you think? Well, just to go back to the sort of terminological issue for a second, I mean, carbon dioxide removal has sort of historically been lumped under geoengineering. I think that that they are separating, if that makes sense, because uh, they're pretty different. Carbon dioxide removal, you know, really means taking CO2 out of the air. And, you know, geoengineering means masking the effects of having a lot of CO2 up there. So they're pretty mm -hmm. different. Um, and in terms of carbon dioxide removal, you're, you know, I completely, I do talk about a lot of schemes and projects, some of which are, you know, in pilot project D kind of stage. I went to visit, you know, my own emissions that had supposedly been 
you know, ostensibly been scrubbed, had been scrubbed, some em someone's emissions had been scrubbed in Iceland and then buried very deep underground in Iceland's volcanic uh, rock where it, it mineralizes, CO2 mineralizes under, you know, sort of heat and pressure with a lot of water. Um, now, that's a very interesting project um, and is actually growing, but as you say, to scale up to the level that it would have a meaningful impact. I mean, we are now um, emitting 40 billion tons of CO2 a year, roughly. So if you want to have a measurable impact uh, on what's up there, you have to you know, be in the billions of tons mode. And that takes a tremendous, uh, it, it's, it is, I agree with you, it is hard to imagine how we get there. Um, yeah, it just, it's interesting. I, I hope they get there, you know, soon, but I don't think so. Uh, an another whole area that your book goes into and, you know, the bulletin covers a lot is the gene editing revolution. CRISPR and what Jennifer Doudna has been doing at Berkeley and a lot of other researchers all around the world. Uh, I just wondered, I mean, to me, this seems like perhaps one of the man's biggest interventions in his environment, the idea that uh, we could essentially write the code of life, you know, make new organisms, you know, make designer babies, super soldiers. Uh, you know, and one of the things you, you looked at was gene drive, you know, the idea of dealing with diseases, for instance, through a gene drive. Can you take a crack at, you know, explaining for us what a gene drive is? And what they're looking at there. Yeah, so gene drive. So, you know, CRISPR is, um, you know, we've been gene editing for a long time now. And what CRISPR does is it makes it a lot easier and a lot cheaper uh, to do gene editing. I myself used a CRISPR enabled kit uh, that I bought, you know, over the internet to gene edit some bacteria, which was a pretty, in my kitchen, which was a pretty interesting experience. Um, and because, so CRISPR is basically a tool borrowed from bacteria and it's encoded in, in it, uh, it itself is encoded in DNA. So if you can manipulate this system, you can actually incorporate it into an organism's own DNA and then the organism will gene edit itself. That is basically the idea behind gene drive. And this way you can propagate change over generations and you can push this trait that you're trying to push out into a population. That's why gene drive is so powerful because normally if you gene edited a creature and you put it out in the wild, that change would be overwhelmed very quickly when that creature mated with a wild, what's called a wild type creature, you know, it would not be passed on or would only be passed on some of the time. But if you do gene drive, you can ensure, once again, in theory at least, that this trait keeps getting propagated through a population. And one of the potential uses of gene drive, which is also very active, there are now some mosquitoes sitting in Italy, actually, that already possess a gene drive, and it's called a suppression drive. It's, it's passing on a trait that's deleterious to the organism, prevents it, usually prevents it from reproducing or inhibits reproduction. So the idea is you would put these mosquitoes out in a place uh, that suffers from malaria and they would eventually cause the whole mosquito population to crash. That's the idea. And therefore these mosquitoes could not transmit malaria. And did you say they've already put some of these out or they're just still no. researching on it? Yeah, they're, they're um, sitting in what you, what is said to be and what I will believe to be is an extremely biosecure facility in Italy. Uh, and I guess, I think one of the thing that, things that people are studying right now is do they in fact drive the population down to zero even, even in these cages that they're in or tanks that they're in. Um, but you know, if it's successful, uh, there is talk already you know, of releasing them in, in Africa, in, in parts of Africa that are uh, suffer from very high rates of malaria. 
and everybody would love for malaria to go away, but there there are side effects of eliminating a whole species, right? I mean, what did the scientists must be concerned about that, right? Yes, and I mean, I think that, uh, you know, with something that is has as high generation rates and is as widespread as some of these mosquito, some of these malaria bearing mosquitoes, I think the odds that this technology would successfully eliminate every single one of these mosquitoes is, is probably pretty low, but it certainly could have local and regional effects, um, you know, on the food chain, on organisms that depend on mosquito larvae for their own, uh, you know, food supply. So I do think there's a question of whether, you know, definitely there will be a lot of conversations about this and who, you know, I don't know who's on the ground doing that kind of research. And that's a, that's a very important question. Um, okay, I, I sort of wanted to move on to this other engineering project just because it was part of my childhood. I grew up in Chicago and it, it's always fascinated me. The, the Chicago River back in history, instead of having it flow into Lake Michigan, they reversed it, made it flow the other way because it was so polluted and foul, they didn't want it going where they got their drinking water. And you wrote a rather lengthy part of your book about this, and it's just fascinating. Why don't you just talk for a minute about that project and CARP and everything else that went with it? Yeah, so that's really sort of, in a way, the most, the clearest and most vivid example of this. Um, pattern, I guess you'd say, of, of intervening and then realizing, oh my gosh, uh, you know, this intervention is, uh, has, is having impacts that we don't care for. So now we're going to have to impose a new layer of intervention. And the original intervention, as you say, is that Chicago reversed the flow of the river that runs through the city so that it would no longer run east into Lake Michigan. Uh, and pollute the city's drinking water because the city was also using the river as a sewer for everything, for its human waste and also for its stockyard waste. Um, so there are still parts of the Chicago River, there's a part called Bubbly Creek where some of the stockyard waste, this organic material is continuing, still sends bubbles up to the water, but you know, methane into the water column because you know, it's still rotting after 80, 90 years. Um, so Chicago reversed the flow of the river and they did this by uniting the Chicago River with the Mississippi River system. And what this, the impact of this, which I don't know that anyone had really thought through, was to connect the Great Lakes drainage basin and the Mississippi drainage basin. Then, which had previously been separate. You were, if you were a fish, you couldn't make it from one to the other. And so, over the course of the 20th century, both the Mississippi system and the Great Lakes system have become highly, highly invaded systems. And you have invasive species introduced all the time, wrecking havoc in different ways. And one whole group of species, which goes by the name of Asian carp, were introduced into the Mississippi system in the 60s and 70s, have completely taken over the river system. In some parts of the system make up three quarters or more of the biomass in the system. And folks who live in Chicago and around the Great Lakes really don't want them in the Great Lakes. So one of the techniques that's being used is they've actually electrified now part of this canal that connected the Great Lakes and the Mississippi Basin in the hopes that a fish that comes up across into this section of the lake where a person would basically die if he or she fell in the water. The fish is supposed to come up against this tremendous amount of voltage and get a shock and, and go back in the direction that it came from. That's the idea at least. Uh, but it sounded like a whole lot of fun to report actually. The one, the one part, I mean, part of this is they're just physically taking as many fish as they can out and throwing them somewhere to die, right? How come it's, are these inedible? How come we just don't, you know, fish them and sell them to people to eat? Yeah, I mean, that's just a weird uh, 
story. Um, no, they're perfectly edible. I, I ate them and people are trying to come up with ways to encourage people to fish for them because if, if there's one thing we know, it's that you know people are capable of overfishing just about anything if they want to. Um, the reason they have not been overfished or a reason they have not been overfished is that they are very, very bony. They're actually considered, you know, a delicacy in Asia. They, you know, uh, they're raised in aquaculture by the, you know, millions and millions of tons. Um, but here in the U.S., we tend to like our fish boneless, and this has been a big impediment. So there are a lot of folks. I met some folks who had some creative ideas and recipes, and they were trying to turn Asian carp into enough of a draw that people that could go out and fish them and process them and make a dent in the population. Right now what happens is Illinois pays fishermen <clears throat> to net them and then they basically get ground up into fertilizer. So very low, you know, very low return kind of uh, enterprise. Yeah, that's kind of strange. Carp bounty, they're paying a carp bounty there. Uh, the I guess at this point, I mean, you've been in many programs talking about your book. Uh, that's the, you know, the thing that authors do is they go on book tours. And I, I wanted to make this one a little bit different. I wanted you to tell me, what is the question you, you don't get asked that you wanted to answer about your book? What, what do you <laughs> want to say about it? Nobody, nobody asks you about. Well, the book, I mean, one of the interesting, or I shouldn't say one of the interesting things, but one of the things about the book is that it's sort of, it sounds like a really serious enterprise. It's, I, it's written, I hope, as sort of a sort of a romp. I hope people find it funny. And I I'm, have been interested sort of that people haven't um, asked me about that. I mean, you could even argue, you know, why, why did I, why take that kind of a tone towards such such grim material, but but somehow that that hasn't um, that hasn't come up too much. So there, that's I guess what I'd like to say that the book is is actually supposed to be kind of fun. Yeah, I I did. I, I found it really fun. It sort of takes you around the world to all these different places, and that's why I'd asked about the solar geoengineering. I mean, your your approach to that, your tone to that, is not the deadly serious, oh my God, how could they even be considering this? It's sort of a, you know, wry, a little bit of a raised eyebrow about these people doing this. Uh, is, I, I'm assuming that that was intentional. You, you chose not to do this very serious kind of, oh my God tone. Yes, exactly. I mean, I, I feel like we're surrounded with, um, oh my God tone. Um, so I was trying to sort of, get these issues in front of people without, uh, you know, I think there's a, I think there's sort of maybe disaster overload at this point. Um, so that was the idea. Okay, uh, great. I, I think uh, I've actually run out of my moderated questions here and I would like the audience to get a chance to get in here. So Hallie, why don't you come back in and tell everybody how to raise their hands and so we can call on them. Great, thanks, John. Hello again. As a reminder, my name is Hallie Posner and I'm the program manager here at the Bulletin. We do ask that you please keep yourselves on mute throughout the program unless you're called on for a question, but please keep your cameras on as we are striving to build community and all of you are members of that space. If you have a question for our speaker or moderator, please use the raise hand function. Our moderator will see that and call on you. Uh, you can find this by either clicking on the participants button or the reaction button at the bottom of your screen. It depends on your Zoom setup where you'll find that. Please do not physically raise your hand. There are too many participants for us to recognize you that way. Also, please note we have many folks on the call, so we apologize in advance if we do not get to your question. If you've already raised your hand, rest assured we see you, but as I said, are unlikely to get to all questions. A recording of this program will be available on our website in the coming days. Back to you, John. Hey, thanks, Ali. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to use a moderator's prerogative and call on an old friend to ask the first question. Terry, Terrence O'Rourke from Houston, what, what can we answer for you? Hello, and thank you. And I so honor what you've done. So please, here's the compliment. 
one of the questions I have, is there a way out that we look for a better future by going beyond the characterization of the Anthropocene to possibly to the Ecozoic era, uh, a, a future in which we communicate with a community of life and ask for questions in a larger community just than a human-centric perspective? Well, I mean, I think that's a really, uh... <laughs> A really important question, obviously. I, I guess I would say if the past is prologue, I don't, I don't see signs of that. I mean, you could say one positive thing I will point to is there's sort of this, you know, movement 30% by 2030. Can we put aside 20, 30% of the country and the world? you know, of, of what we'll call wild lands because really nothing is really wild anymore. That's sort of one of the the E.O. Wilson approach, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think that that is, um, you know, that's a positive sign, let's put it that way, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, we, we just went through an administration that was actually taking land out of protection. So, you know, but, you know, are we ever going to be a species that um, really seriously considers the well-being of other species, um, you know, before our own. Uh, I guess I would say I don't see it. Uh, I haven't seen any evidence of it really, much evidence of it, you know, throughout human history. I don't want to claim to be a tremendous expert here, um, but that requires, you know, a change in consciousness at a time of, you know, what many people would argue will be you know, sort of maximum human population over the next century, uh, where resources may well be short for humans. So the idea that you know, we're suddenly going to come to this new consciousness, I guess, you know, I hope so, but I don't, see, I don't see a lot of reason to believe that's going to happen. How's that? Yeah, I accept that. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Uh, I'm gonna move on to uh often contributor to the bulletin, and I'm glad you're here. Alan Robach, why don't you uh, chime in here? Thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed your book. I do research on geoengineering, and on my list of potential risks includes that the sky would be whiter. Some of my research colleagues push back on that, and they say, oh, it really wouldn't get very much whiter. It would still be pretty blue. And I'm just wondering how much pushback you've gotten about the title of your book. Yes, that's the one thing I would say I have gotten pushback for. And uh, I would acknowledge that there's a, to call it under a white sky as opposed to under a whiter, I guess I could have called it under a whiter sky. But I, so there's a certain poetic license there. I, I should acknowledge that, how's that? But um, yes, that's the one, I'm sure that the, I have gotten some pushback on that from the geoengineering community, such as it is. Yeah, I, I like the title, but some people are more <laughs> positively disposed to eventually doing it, and they look at that as they, they see that as a threat. Yes, I'm sure they. I'm sure that's true. And it also implies at night you can't see the Milky Way. Yeah, I don't know. What does the research suggest about stargazing with geoengineering? It all depends on how much stuff you put up there. Yeah, what um, what is your? I should ask you. I, I, I relied on your work for for a part of the book. What what is your sense of what, what you know the state of the research these days in terms of the the simply the impact on the appearance of the sky, which arguably is a, is is not the one that we should be focusing on. Well, I have a list of a large number of potential risks, and this is an aesthetic thing. It's really hard to quantify. I mean. I look outside today and it's cloudy. So I live under a white sky right now. So we, we all do part of the time. The question is when there are no regular clouds, how blue will it be and how important is that? I just don't know how to evaluate that. Do we have to live with that in order to eliminate global warming? Uh, that and many other risks, that's the question we're doing research on. Okay, hey, thanks Alan. Thanks for being here today, really. Uh, I'm gonna sort of go in order of people who pop up on my screen, except that Jeff Potter has such a beautiful beach behind him, but I'm gonna call on him next. Jeff. Thank you, that's the Jersey Shore. Although I'm in Chicago. 
Um, Elizabeth, uh, thank you for you know tackling this huge and important project and concept and helping us understand it. Uh, is there a particular entity? I got to believe it's something with the United Nations that could help sort out all the political and ethical type questions, um, so we can actually, as a species, launch enough of a geoengineering program or programs to make a difference? Well, this is, um, you know, a huge issue, the, the, the geopolitics and who would, you know, if you decided you wanted to do, you know, I think research is already complicated. Um, and if you decide you actually want to do it, I mean, who's you, who's deciding, who gets to decide? These are huge questions that um, I, I don't think anyone has the answer for there. You know, there's a Carnegie initiative now uh, kind of asking that question, but there's no real mechanism. I mean, weather, weather modification uh, is, is, you know, basically bar, you know, barred by international bodies. So um, whether, you know, what, what's going to happen and you know this leads to people worrying that people are going to just you know some group of countries would just do it on its own or some even people have raised the prospect of you know some r r random billionaire although i don't think that's very plausible but certainly a group of powerful nations who decided to do it could could presumably do it on their own but the geopolitics and the geo governance are huge uh huge issues uh, maybe a related question would be could we use like the food the food chain that humans rely upon uh and i think that maybe goes into uh alan's question or, or terry's the idea that we are going to need fish and the fish need to have plankton right and so could we by tackling you know taking concrete steps to ensure the sustainability of a human's food supply uh get to that the chain of life, I guess, would be even mosquitoes, I think, have a, have a role in that ultimately our food chain. Um, you mean, how, how would that lead us to uh, global governance? Well, I guess, could it uh, could those things add up and could that give us a concrete way to get the authority from uh, the people, I guess, to say, yeah, well, they are taking steps to make sustainable uh, fishing for human consumption in the future, and therefore we're going to go along with any kind of small scale geoengineering that'll ensure the sustainability of our fishing stock. Um, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, the question of how much input, you know, how do you get global buy in to anything? I mean, I think that, you know, one of the many problems behind geoengineering, including the question of will it work, which is a pretty fundamental one, <laughs> it are you know, different regions, um, you know, are you, are you, you know, the Russians, for example, they, you know, you, you sort of want to, you know, freeze parts of Siberia, I suppose. And, you know, why would they, mm. you know, buy into that? So, uh, and they're also big fossil fuel producers, you know, so it, it gets really, really complicated. I don't know that anyone has come up with a scenario by which, you know, you get global buy into this. And that's, you know, in fact, there's, I'm, I fear, and I'm happy if someone else wants to take this question too, maybe Alan, you know, you could, you could see much more potential for global conflict um, mm -hmm. than for global cooperation. But, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't have a crystal ball here either. So sure. I, I, I don't have a clear answer to that one. Yeah, and since we're talking about geoengineering a lot, I, I wanted to emphasize just how controversial it is. I mean, there are people at the bulletin who advocate not even talking about it, not writing about it, because that makes it seem reasonable when they think it is not. So it's a very, uh, very, very controversial issue that there is no, nothing like a consensus that we should do solar geoengineering at all. Uh, Anyway, um, moving on, how about Eric Schreiber? 
Oh, thank you. And, and thank you for being here. My question is, okay, under a whiter sky, what kind of uh, chatter has there been in the scientific literature about the various effects on photosynthesis? Well, I should, I really should refer to Alan. Where, where is Alan there? You know, I think that that is not one of the major concerns is my understanding. Um, because you're, you know, you're changing how much direct sunlight hits the earth, but, but plants actually do fine with, you know, sort of indirect sunlight. But, you know, that's certainly a, a question and how will it affect solar power generation? Um, so I, I don't know, Alan, where does, where is Alan? Maybe he wants to take that one. Yeah, uh, if, if there's a cloud in the stratosphere, you get more diffuse radiation and less direct radiation, a couple percent less, but plants like diffuse radiation. After the Pinatubo volcanic eruption 30 years ago, plants grew more and sucked more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It depends how much uh, stuff you put up there and what the effects are. But as Elizabeth said, direct solar uh, power, which comes from focusing the direct sunlight, there was a 30% reduction after Pinatubo. So it depends which impact you're looking at, but no, there's no, people don't see much of a threat on global uh, or ecosystems we really have to analyze, but we don't see much of a threat, uh, a large scale threat on plants. But that's something we have a proposal into the National Science Foundation right now to study ecosystem impacts. So we hope we get funded to look at that. Right, I was wondering about the spectral uh, changes that there might be some important uh, uh, wavelength that would be now, eliminated by The main that. thing is that it would destroy ozone and you get a lot more ultraviolet radiation. So that would, that's the main effect on the, the wavelength. Okay, Bob, very good. Why don't we move on to Mark and I'm probably gonna butcher your last name, Dunau, Dunau in New York. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, and it's actually something I was disappointed in in uh, Elizabeth's book, is that over the last 2,000 years, we've lost half the Earth's biomass, including half the Earth's plant life. And the history of the atmosphere is actually a history. It's, the atmosphere has been created by life. And so my question is, why is there no discussion of plant life through transpiration, uh, cloud formation and shade cools the planet. So why is there no discussion in, in your books about the severe effect of losing half the plant life and the effect of human aridifying the 5 billion hectares of earth as part of this problem? And perhaps a solution. I, I did want to just butt in before you answer Elizabeth. Her last book was called The Sixth Extinction. So she's written about that a bit. Uh, but Elizabeth, over to you. Well, I I don't I don't have a sort of a, a good answer to that. I don't uh, even know that I can honestly speak to the premise that we've lost half of the world's biomass over the last two thousand years. I, I honestly don't even know if that's the case or not, um, or how we would calculate that. But you know, certainly we've ripped through the world's forests. We've cut down a tremendous amount of the world's forests and turned it into agricultural fields. And certainly a certain amount of the world has been desertified by our actions. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, I, you know, I don't take up every single problem <laughs> that humanity has caused. Uh, uh, but as you say, as Don pointed out, I did write a piece called The Six Extinctions. So I'm not, it's not like I, uh, just uh, take that lightly, has that our destruction of life, you know, our, our driving of other species into oblivion and our, and our impacts even, you know, long before we reach extinction of really reducing, uh, you know, simply reducing, uh, as, as, as the question suggested, the amount of biomass on the planet. Okay, Th thanks, Elizabeth. And at this point, I'm going to try to speed things up because we got a bunch of people who want to ask questions and we're beginning to run out of time. So if you could ask your question succinctly, that would help us. David Grant from Baltimore. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Just very briefly uh, regarding CRISPR, how much danger is there from a Unabomber type individual 
uh, creating something that would be omnicidal. I'm sorry, that would be that would be like a you mean like a bioweapon or Oh well, yes, it would be really omnicidal to the point where it would be a virus that really couldn't be stopped, let us say. Some psychopathic person. Well, I I really don't want to claim to be, you know, an expert here. Um, I think you would have to be extremely knowledgeable. You know, you, you have to know what you're doing to make viruses um, more dangerous. So I don't, you know, it's not something that I think most of us could do. But I do think that, uh, you know, CRISPR makes does make gene editing a, a lot easier. Uh, and so the question of what people could, who were quite knowledgeable and devious, could kick up, cook up in their kitchens um, is, is a serious one, you know, absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember in, in the bulletin, our experts four or five years ago were writing about how hard it was, how unlikely it was that there would be a lone wolf creating some sort of bioweapon that had huge impacts. And they're not really writing that now. They're concerned about the ease with which uh, somebody just with a PhD, some random person could, could make something dangerous. Uh, all right, on, on to uh, Hamilton Richards from Austin, Texas. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, my question is whether uh, writing and speaking about geoengineering could be a useful spur to intensify the efforts of its opponents who want to find other ways of coping with the climate crisis? You know, I, I think that's a good question. And I don't, you know, I don't really have an agenda, if that makes sense. I, I definitely want to, to point out, you know, this pattern that this is the kind of solutions that we as a species reach for, you know, when we are uh, up against it. And unfortunately, we are up against it now. Um, but yes, if it spurs people <laughs> to say, well, that's not what we want. We really want to, you know, work as to reduce CO2 emissions as quickly as possible and as dramatically as possible. That's our response even to, you know, people wanting to do research on geoengineering. You know, that's a very legitimate response in my view, a very reasonable one. So, um, you know, I say, yeah, go for it. Good. Uh... We'll move on quickly here. Andy Schlickman, you're next. Thank you very much. Um, it, I, I joined a few minutes late, Elizabeth, so if you address this, I apologize. But you know, when I get on calls like this, this call's a good example. Most of the people that seem to be on, with few exceptions, are people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, like me. And I was wondering, what type of reaction are you getting from 20 and 30 year olds to your book? What type of questions, what type of concerns? It, it's a broad question, but in a summary fashion, what's been their reaction? Well, I can't answer that, unfortunately, because we've all been stuck <laughs> on Zoom. So, so usually on these Zoom calls, I don't even see who's on there. So I don't even know who's on there. So this is unusual in that I'm you know, seeing you right now. Um, but, you know, at some point, I, I hope, I can't anticipate, I will, you know, before, before COVID hit, I, you know, spoke fairly regularly on college campuses. And so I got, you know, got much more of the pulse of, um, you know, younger people at that time. I, right now, I'm so disconnected from the world, everyone's so disconnected from the world that I, I, can't, I can't offer a good answer to that, I'm sorry. Okay, th thank you much. We'll quickly move on to Frank Johnston. Where are you, Frank? Um, I, I was struck by uh, the author's uh, title. And don't we have the uh, whiter sky already in uh, the uh, uh, contrails from uh, aircraft, uh, uh, international aircraft, which we also see lining up at St. John River Valley. And isn't that worth uh, one centigrade degree uh, plus and minus in uh, uh, surface uh, temperature already? And so do we know uh, what some of the ancillary effects are? And isn't it a warning for the future? We already are doing geoengineering and see major effects. We already are. I mean, the contrails, I really, really don't want to get into that. That is a 
you know, I'm gonna, you know, <laughs> I don't know even how to, how to, how to run that. What, what's we, observed? We, 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 contrails are, you know, not causing a one centigrade uh, temperature difference. Uh, we are geoengineering by pouring a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. If you want to call that geoengineering, we are changing the climate by pouring CO2 into the atmosphere. That is, you know, absolutely without a doubt. And we are also, you know, putting a lot of particulate matter into the atmosphere that also does have a, you know, whitening effect. So for example, when you're, you know, in New York City, you, or, you know, Beijing, you, you don't, you very rarely see a very deep blue sky. So yes, we are having those effects, but I'm going to, um, you know, very avidly avoid talking about contrast because that is a, a rabbit hole that I don't want to go down. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't referring to uh, the conspiracy theory. I was, I'm referring to the effect that was seen in 9 11. That, that when you, then when contrails disappeared, yeah, that, that the sky was cleaner or, or what? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, well, yes, definitely. But, um, but contrails are just you know, not the major way that we're influencing the atmosphere. Okay. Um... Then somebody who's been waiting patiently the whole time, Michael Fullerton, uh, what would you like to ask us? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, I, I like the book and the previous book. I have a question about geoengineering. As I understand it, um, if you did it once and then the particles float down after two or three years, you'd have to send even more particles up the next time and the time after that. But I don't understand why that's true. Well, the, the idea here is if you're continuing to put CO2 into the atmosphere, then that's going to, then the warming is ratcheting up. And if you want to get the same cooling effect, then the cooling also has to ratchet up too. Uh, keep pace with that. That's the idea. Now, once again, you could do it however you wanted. You could keep, you know, uh, the amount stable if you wanted to year by year, but then the world would, then the warming would, you know, potentially would keep ramping up as well. So there's no, that's the reason why, you know, it's generally in a deployment scheme, you will generally see that it ramps up um, because to, to counteract the effect of CO2, which is also ramping up. Um, but you know, there's also this idea that, well, eventually we'll stop emitting CO2 so that you could do this in a sort of interim way. You would sort of ramp it up and then you'd ramp it down. And then you know, eventually we would get back to some pre-industrial climate. That would be the sort of most optimistic, happiest uh, outlook. OK. Um... Thanks for that answer. And I think at this point, because we, we have no other hand raised, I'm gonna just gonna throw it back to you. Do you have any final thoughts, Elizabeth? Uh, what, what did you think about what we talked about today, generally? What did I think about what we talked about today? Well, these are the, these are the huge issues. I mean, people raised the, um, we do have one more, we do have a couple, oh my God. All of a sudden people start <laughs> raising their hands. <laughs> Rob wants to answer a question now. Yeah, yeah let's, let's let Rob Sokolo ask his question. Yeah, okay, because something's missing from the conversation, which is the that we are, don't understand the planet anywhere near as well as we should. And, and there's a connection because since we don't know how fast climate change will arrive, um, and we really don't. The climate science is just not as aggressive as, as it could be. Uh, we, will, we do face the option which the advocates of climate change emphasize uh, that if bad climate change arrives very quickly, we will, we will reach for geoengineering. And like a medicine we haven't tested very well, uh, we won't know what it does. And so to prepare ourselves for the eventualities we hope don't happen where the climate positive feedbacks kick in all over the place. We ought to be, do, it's responsible to, do, to be ready. And that there is nonetheless a fuse between research and deployment. And 
And, and again, if, if we said more about learning about the earth, nobody is talking about expanding dramatically our global effort, to learn about the earth, measurements, models. Um, we just are we're too complacent about that in my view. I wonder what your comment is, Betsy. Well, I mean, the book, you know, I mean, that is the argument. I, I think the book does lay out that argument. I hope very clearly that's Frank Koich's argument. You know, Frank is leading at Harvard, is leading um, this initiative, and that's his argument. We don't have a lot of tools, and we better, you know, know uh, whether this one even works or not, or we might want to know whether this one even works or not. I think that's a legitimate argument, too. I, I think one of the you know, privileges of being a journalist is I, 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 don't, I don't have to decide that. I don't get to decide that, uh, whether this, you know, research is more or less dangerous than no research. Um, we don't have very good, you know, um, ways of deciding that as a society, someone will have to decide that, but it's, you know, it's not gonna be me. Um, and I'm, it's not even gonna be the bulletin, you know, it's gonna be uh, on an ad hoc basis, and that's not necessarily the best way to do it. Now, in terms of, you know, should we be having more research into Earth systems? And, you know, now that we're monkeying around with them in all sorts of ways, you know, absolutely. <laughs> How's that? I can only say yes. Yeah. Okay. Th thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, I, Rob, any, anything else? A rejoinder? No, let others come in. No. Okay. And I'm, I need to ask Kelly, if I try to squeeze these last two questions in, am I going to cause some huge problem? <laughs> OK, uh, quickly, quickly ask a question. Richard Donovan. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate your, your writing as a, as a journalist. And, and uh, one, one thing I, I find particularly concerning about the notion of geoengineering and our way out of this problem is that as an engineer, as someone who is in the academy, we are woefully inadequate in our engineering education systems to be preparing our engineers for doing anything even remotely like this. And, uh, and this, is a, this is my real concern about this is that, you know, we're not going to design these things today and tomorrow and the next year but boy, we have a bunch of people going through our engineering programs who do not understand complexity. They barely understand calculus. And, <laughs> and you know, to, to add in this layer of complexity, I think is asking a lot of those engineers. Well, I, I, I will just say, I don't think we're, I mean, I, I have a lot of admiration for engineers. I don't think we're leaving this completely to engineers. We're, we're going to be leaving, you know, we're going to have a lot of, you know, stratospheric uh, scientists who study the stratosphere from different perspectives. But, you know, whether anyone can master the complexity of these systems is, is a very key question. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I think, unfortunately, I'm going to need to throw this back to Halley. We have a, a few time constraints here. Thank you all so much. And, and thank you, Elizabeth. It's really a wonderful program. And thank all of you for showing up and watching. Back to you, Halley. Thanks, John. Thank you to you both, Elizabeth and John, for this interesting and thought-provoking conversation. Uh, and everyone, please stay tuned for our April 26th virtual program called The AI Era, What Will the Future Look Like? Featuring Microsoft's Eric Horvitz and Duke University's Missy Cummings. And last but not least, thank you to all of you, members of the Bulletin's community, for participating with us this last hour. Ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned.